Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Kelly Godshaw, Marketing Systems Specialist here at Sales Staff. Our webinar today should run around 45 minutes, and the recorded version will be available after today's webinar. As we proceed through today's webinar, we invite you to make comments, ask questions, and live tweet during today's session using the hashtag MVPWebinar. You can always ask questions via the GoToWebinar user interface, but we're closely monitoring the Twitter feed for awesome questions and comments. There's also a bonus for using Twitter during today's session. At the end of the webinar, we're going to select a random user who tweets using our hashtag to win a $50 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced at the end of today's webinar. Our speaker this afternoon is Sales Staff Vice President of Demand Generation, Rick Riddle. Rick brings more than 20 years of experience in energy in driving demand and stewarding customer success. Rick's integrated approach to engaging target audiences, shaping brand attitudes, and generating qualified pipeline for sales teams makes him a valuable contributor to the sales staff executive team. Before I turn it over to Rick, I just have one last question um, for our audience. Are you guys tweeting yet? Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Kelly. And welcome, everyone, to our webinar today, Discover the Real MVP of Your Sales Funnel. And you know, while your prospect probably thinks it's her, it's probably not. And it's that time of year again, right? We cannot talk about March without mentioning March Madness, wins, losses, last-second chances, who's in, who's out. And while some of you are thinking basketball, I'm thinking sales. End of the first quarter, how are we doing? How does the rest of our year look? What kind of changes are already in order? What's working, what's not? Yep, it's March Madness, all right. You know, this year over 40 million Americans will fill out over 70 million brackets for the NCAA men's basketball tournament. And according to Nate Silver of 538, the odds of predicting a perfect bracket this year are 1 in 1.6 billion. You have a better chance of winning an Olympic gold medal than to choose every tournament basketball game outcome correctly. But after today's webinar, your odds of improving your lead generation and pipeline velocity are pretty close to 100%. You know, in our last webinar, we showed you how to build the ultimate sales funnel. We talked about driving prospects through the middle of the funnel for closed sales, focusing on delighting clients and long-term expansion through the other end. Well, in today's webinar, we're going to talk about why too many leads can actually be bad for funnel health why your salespeople shouldn't be prospecting, how to accelerate the flow in your sales funnel, and then how to build that perfect team. And as an added bonus, once you implement a suggestion or two that we'll discuss, what kind of an impact should you expect on your organization? With buyers spending more time doing their own research, marketing's job in identifying and nurturing leads is becoming more difficult. According to the Corporate Executive Board, prospects tend to go through 70% of the sales process before ever even engaging with a salesperson. In fact, for the most part, today's buyer can self-identify, self-medicate, and even self-select their own solution all on their own. One of the biggest challenges many organizations face today is a lack of alignment between sales and marketing. In an age of big data, marketing automation, Predictive intelligence and CRM, sales and marketing alignment can make or break effective demand generation. Now, best-in-class organizations understand which touch point today's buyer prefers. If you don't leverage for contact and engagement so that your salespeople are not chasing down poorly qualified or totally unqualified prospects, your salespeople will dismiss your efforts and follow up based on their own personal preference. As a young salesperson, I always look forward to what we call fishbowl time. My company would attend a large industry trade show with marketing staffers manning the booth at some exotic location that we were never allowed to go to as salespeople. To draw booth attendees, they'd give away anything from a squishy ball to a free vacation, all in exchange for someone dropping their business card in the bowl. After the show, they'd high-five one another for a great show, another massive number of leads collected then bring the bowl back to the office and dump them all out, dividing an equal number between all of us salespeople. I'd take my new batch of leads and begin right away looking for any company logo I recognize or a title I felt comfortable calling. It wasn't long before I realized that I was probably doing all the wrong things. And so I'd learned that if I was not going to be at the trade show myself, 
if I wasn't going to be there qualifying prospects myself, in the booth myself, and hoarding all of the good leads for myself, then marketing's lead gen efforts were wasted on me. Now, and also as a, as a young sales rep, I wanted every single lead I could get my hands on. My best leads, by the way, didn't come from marketing. They came from friends, family, client referrals. Unfortunately, for those early prospects of mine, and I'll apologize to all of you right now if any of you are here during this webinar, uh, each of you got the same pitch from me and always the same treatment. No buy now, no call back from Rick. Every sales leader, by the way, probably faces a similar dilemma. You need to have more sales-ready leads faster than competition. And your CEO is probably asking you right now to sell into brand new markets and win more business than last year. And maybe the leads aren't the problem. Maybe the problem lies in how they're being managed. There's no such thing as too many qualified leads. Don't get me wrong. No such thing as too many qualified leads. Not having the appropriate lead qualification system as part of your overall revenue plan, now that can be disastrous. So how do we fix that? I think there's five critical ways, and here they are. First, one of the best ways to hold your marketing and sales teams accountable is through a service level agreement, or an SLA. In an SLA, marketing and sales mutually agree on the level of service one expects from the other, and then they hold each other accountable. Don't overcomplicate it. A good starting point could be that uh, maybe marketing will deliver a certain number of sales accepted leads, or SALs, based on a particular prospect profile, and at a certain quality for sales each week or each month, quarter, whatever your period is, and that sales will work that certain number of SALs and then report back to marketing on the results. Everything that salespeople do ties back to one metric, revenue. Sales pros are hired, fired, promoted, and recognized based on their ability to land dream clients with a company. And as a 25-year sales veteran, I can't think of a single compliment, nor do I have a plaque on anywhere in my wall rewarding me for my cool prospecting skills. Simply put, if you're part of a demand generation effort for your company, Every single action you take from profiling your ideal prospect to number of touches, types of touches, engaging conversations, influencing, qualifying, should be tied to getting your salespeople in front of the very best prospects for your solution offering. And, and by integrating data and technology, you power your demand generation practice so that you can achieve repeatable, predictable, and scalable revenue results. Now, your, your salespeople need to understand their prospects better, right? And they need to tailor their approach to the individual buyer. But how can they communicate effectively with someone about whom they have very little information? Or the information is nothing more than an automated lead score. Well, they can't. And that's where sales enablement comes in. Marketing should enable both ends of the conversation while making content available to engage and inform potential buyers on the prospect side of the conversation. Marketing has to also arm sales reps with lead scores, engagement tools like playbooks, and activity history with a lead qualification person on the sales side. And, and by the way, it's not a, a one and done process. Both marketing and sales leadership needs to continuously focus on quantifying contributions that ultimately convert to revenue. Rather than have a let's get as many leads as possible plan, I prefer a no prospect left behind mentality. Let's have a chalk talk. If you're in marketing, you are eyeballs deep right now in the science, the analytics, and the data-driven approach it takes to drive an anonymous visitor into an ideal prospect within the sales funnel. And although metrics and process are equally as important, if you're in sales, you're probably thinking in much simpler terms, right? Trigger events, number of meetings, demos, proposals, license agreements, contracts, anything that helps deposit checks in the bank faster. You know, oftentimes, salespeople just simply can't rely on marketing to generate enough leads to meet their sales targets, or they just don't have the luxury of a demand generation machine in place to help. So if they want leads, they have to prospect. I did for years, and that meant lots and lots of cold calling and making my own sales appointments. Some of you on the phone are probably doing that right after this webinar. By the way, there are a few things that, as salespeople, we hate more or that demotivates us more than prospecting. But if your pipeline's not full of qualified prospect, what's the alternatives? So I'm not saying that sales pros should not prospect. Hear me right. I'm not saying that salespeople should not prospect. It's just that your salespeople are the wrong people to do it. They're an expensive resource 
and you need them to be in front of prospects actively selling, not spending time researching and identifying opportunities. Even if the salesperson is good at prospecting, we all give it up as soon as we generate a pipeline, right? As for me, I couldn't wait to stop prospecting and I quickly dropped all that activity so that I could get back to doing what I did best and what motivated me the most, closing. Prospecting is a time-intensive task. It requires an organized, committed effort. It's not a job for Tuesday morning or sometime on Thursday. It requires dedicated resources to identify the right people, engage with them, gain an understanding of their business needs and challenges, and most importantly, influence their selection process by educating them when they're learning about their solution options. Finally, with more and more complex buying decisions being made by multiple people on the buy side, it just makes sense to specialize on the sell side too. For the most part, prospects don't care who they talk to as long as there is value in the conversation. In the B2B sales world today, it's savvy to build some consensus lower in the organization among, say, researchers or influencers before the decision-making executives are open to even getting involved with you. Utilizing lead qualifiers to manage those opportunities is not only more effective for your organization, it's also in alignment with how B2B buyers engage today. So unless you enjoy the peaks and valleys, feast and famine approach to acquiring new business, prospecting should never stop. It should be a perpetual activity, which is why it should be done by someone else other than salespeople. According to Marketing Sherpa, 61% of B2B buyers send all leads directly to sales. However, only 27% of those leads will ever be qualified. You can get the 13 or more touches very quickly. The problem is that most leads rarely receive any touches beyond receiving a very passive email or filling out a response form. This, this study that Microsoft did shows that by the fourth contact, nine out of 10 salespeople have given up. I know when it was me, I probably gave up after one or two. And the reason we give up is because it's not what we do best. We're sales closers, not pre-sales qualifiers. With slim resources anyway today, this is not something you want your expensive quota carrying sales reps working on. You want them focused on closing business and bringing the best clients into your, into your company. Let's face it, most salespeople don't, they won't, and it's a pain to get them to do it anyway, right? You won't come close to making your number with sales doing the initial follow-up. You want someone whose sole job it is in life to pursue your leads, make sure they're a fit, guide their engagement with you, and then and only then, connect them to sales. So let's talk about how to accelerate those lead flow flows through your funnel. And, and by the way, if you're using Twitter today, uh, remember that we're trying to extend this conversation across social media using the hashtag MVPWebinar. So go ahead and type in any interesting comments you have or you'd like to share with, with the Demand Gen community uh, or any questions that you have for me. Uh, just go to hashtag MVPWebinar. So, Pipeline velocity. By the way, if you, if you know this equation, good for you. If you use it, even better. If you don't, here's a quick little lesson. Knowing just the value of your sales pipeline is rarely enough. You must be able to gauge the speed at which opportunities progress from stage to stage and the average sales cycle time it takes to get there. Establishing a pipeline velocity metric specific to your company allows you to accurately predict sales results. It also helps you determine the actions and the activities that you need to ensure adequate pipeline for future sales periods. So let's look at these four variables. And with these, you can build a, a basic pipeline velocity calculation that will help you predict future sales and whether or not they'll increase or decrease based on your current business conditions. And it's very simple. It just simply says, let's take your, your, your sales accepted leads. Now, these are the meetings. These aren't marketing qualified or a prospect list. These are the the marketing qualified leads that when nurtured, sales agrees and accepts that they're ready for a conversation. You take the number of those sales accepted leads, you multiply them by your win rate in your company for your brand and your solution right now, and then you multiply that by your average sales price for your average deal size. Then you divide that by the average length of your sales cycle. Simply put, you're trying to get the ball in from one side of the court and score on the other. So let's take a quick look. By the way, the larger the number, the better your pipeline velocity rate. In this comparison, let's put the onus on demand generation, not sales. Win rate and average sales price remains the same. By simply increasing the number of sales accepted leads by two and reducing the sales cycle time from 60 to, say, 50 days, 
you'll be improving your pipeline velocity by 44%. And as you become more confident in the accuracy of this metric, you can continue to fine tune it by adding additional variables. Maybe with training, your win rates improve. Maybe you've got something to add to your product and your average sales price improves. Maybe you're selling enterprise deals instead of transactional deals. All of those things fit together to build a pipeline velocity number. If you get it above four, consider yourself really, really golden. Uh, above six is, is just lightning quick and good. So larger gains are possible by increasing deal size, improving win rates. But if you put the onus strictly on your demand gen team, number of meetings, and improved cycle time, you can still get that same improvement. So now that we've got a couple of concepts underway, let's, let's go build that perfect team. What does that perfect team look like? And, and how do we specialize to do what we said we're going to do? Here are three basic functions of specialization. Now, again, moving the ball up the court. Let's start on the left. That ball is our marketing qualified lead, and we've got a score. So first place of specialization is the inbound lead rep. They bring the lead into play, if you will. They qualify leads that, that are found um, through your website, your chat line, or your phone. The sources of these leads are, are search engine optimization, blogs, referrals, webinars like this, social media, and content marketing. Um, and, but again, they're finding you. These reps, by the way, share attractive, relevant, engaging content to earn that prospect's attention. But again, they're finding you. If you need to find them, then you have an outbound prospecting rep. They proactively find and develop new leads. They prospect into targeted accounts to develop new sales opportunities from stale, cold, dead, dying, inactive accounts. The, the sources of these leads generally uh, are outbound marketing like email, paid search, direct mail if you do, and events. They directly seek out prospects by pushing your message out. Keep in mind that in both cases, by the way, <coughs> excuse me, these reps do not close deals but they create and qualify new sales opportunities and then pass them on to sales to close. Your sales closers, by the way, these are your quota carrying reps who close the business. They're the scores. They can either be inside or outside reps, but their main goal is to score. You don't want these guys, you don't want these gals doing anything but closing business. And, and for some organizations, there's a, there's a fourth position, account manager or, or customer success rep. These are the ones who are responsible for client onboarding, client success, ongoing account management, upsells, cross-sells, renewals. Again, if, if someone needs to be dedicated to making customers successful, it's this person. It's not your closer. If someone needs to prospect and find new business, it's an inbound or an outbound rep, it's not your closer. I, in fact, I like what Aaron Ross wrote in his best-selling book, Predictable Revenue. Your prospectors should not close. Your prospectors should not respond to inbound leads. Your prospectors should not act as a part-time telemarketer for marketing who want them to fill their events. Your prospectors should prospect. So sales gets paid to close business. Marketing gets paid to send leads to sales that will close. Trouble is, neither party knows for sure which leads are most likely to close. The key to every lead management process is to have a human being tied to a phone-based function that sits between lead generation and sales opportunity management. What they do all day is follow up on leads for marketing, and then based on a set of qualification criteria, decide which ones should go forward to sales, which ones should be continually nurtured by them personally, and which ones maybe should be passed back to marketing for some other automatic nurturing. When you have a qualified lead, you don't want a sales rep to call once and leave a voicemail like I used to do. You want someone whose sole responsibility is to reach your best prospects, address their issues, ensure that they're a good fit for your solution, and then and only then get them connected with your salesperson. Craig Rosenberg writes a blog called The Funnel Holic. He says that you can run the best integrated campaign, but you will fail if you've not built a lead qualification process that includes a solid lead qualification team. Now, whether you refer to them as Market development reps, lead qualification reps, lead generators, business development reps, I don't care. Uh, don't call them inside salespeople, by the way, because they're not. They're not inside salespeople. They are demand generation folks. This is a must. You've got to have these B2B people on your team today. These are the folks that are the true most valuable players in manage, managing your sales funnel. These are the MVPs. And, and tracking performance, by the way, is essential for making sure that your team is contributing to a healthy funnel. So you'll need specific benchmarks with which to measure it against, 
here are some standard data points that, that we use and some of our clients use, probably most of you on the phone, to, uh, that you use to, to keep in mind for building that, that all-star demand generation team, the team of MVPs I'm talking about. This means, by the way, knowing how hard your reps are working, how effective they are at creating high-quality opportunities, and, and what percentage of those leads eventually turn into deals. The best way to get the most from your outbound prospecting team or your inbound team is to use data to help you stay on track and then regularly measure your performance against expectations. This way you can easily demonstrate to your team and other members of your company how effective your prospecting has been and what you're doing to continuously improve it. You should use reporting and dashboard tools, maybe gamification to help you track your performance in these areas, but make sure that you're tracking the three most important areas, activity, productivity, and process. Now, over the past few years, there's been an explosion in technology and tools to help marketing teams perform at, at top levels. In fact, four years ago, there were less than 100 companies in that marketing technology sector. Today, the landscape includes almost 1,900. Now, here's a few, by the way. And uh, this, this is not a, uh, an endorsement for all of these. We use many of these very, very well. And if you can, I encourage you to do the same. Scott Brinker, by the way, is the, the foremost uh, marketing tech blogger that I know. And you can find his insights at chiefmartech.com. Uh, so if you want to go find these and those other 1,876 technologies I spoke about, he's got some really cool infographics that will show the, uh, the evolution of marketing technology. Now, what's, what's obviously missing from this very short list is marketing automation. With more, with more than 100 options today, I strongly encourage you to, to dig into your process first and make sure that it faithfully accomplishes everything you need to find, connect, and convert a suspect to a prospect to an opportunity to a client. So do not, I repeat, do not invest in technology first, hoping that your particular demand gen and sales process will adapt. It won't. If your process is weak, then technology will make a whole lot of bad things happen very, very quickly. Some companies, by the way, get enamored with technology. They get so enamored that they tend to make the mistake of automating the whole demand generation process. I did too early on. In fact, I bought me some marketing automation several years ago. I came back and plugged it into the wall and just sat there rubbing my hands together, waiting for all my leads to come jumping out of the top of the box. Not only did I learn that there's nothing magical about technology and automation, I learned that too many underqualified, totally unqualified, dead, cold, recycled leads getting into my sales funnel, creating wasted time for my sales team, low morale and demotivated closers was killing me. So once again, without a layer of human intervention in your demand generation process, you will fail. You'll first start falling behind. Competitors will get by you quicker than ever before, and then I promise you, you will fail. And you're talking to someone who did because of this very reason. Michael Jordan had Scottie Pippen. Batman had Robin, and your sales team needs these MVPs in charge of engaging live time with prospects to address, is to address issues challenge their qualification, by the way, grade their interests, and then and only then introduce them to your sales team. Now, if I was going to only show you one slide today, and if you were only going to take one slide from the presentation and maybe copy it out and stick it up on your wall somewhere, this might be it. Uh, over on the right, you see a, a graphic representation of the webinar we did in building the ultimate funnel of, of, of just a couple months back. And you'll see, by the way, that, that explore, research, all the way to purchase and use that's what your prospect is doing. So that's not your sales funnel. That's their buying process. And in that funnel that was represented on the right, here's, here's what's happening in the generation, the demand generation waterfall on the left. So it goes from a, from a prospect all the way to a closed one or lost client. So your prospect, often, more often than not, by the way, is shopping without you. They're interacting on your website. They're downloading some of your content, watching your emails. Maybe they're even engaging in some social conversations with some of their own trusted or third-party resources or reading a blog. They're getting your emails. They're, they're maybe, maybe there's phone calls or they've been to an event or a particular campaign. But at some point, they really do fit, either from an implicit and, and an explicit standpoint, your ideal prospect profile. And maybe through an automation effort, their, their lead score, as they, do, uh, as they do engage more with your brand and as they're downloading that content, viewing certain pages, um, you're, you're developing a lead score for them. And once it crosses over a particular threshold, they become a marketing qualified lead. This is a person that fits our profile. This is a person that we should be selling to. 
and we should begin our lead qualification process based on their behavior right now. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's that sales accepted lead. That's where your MVP of your funnel is now taking the ball and moving it down the court. They are there to have conversations, to verify the influence of who they're talking to, confirm their interests, validate that they even should be a client of yours, and then guide their journey to a sales rep. Now it's a sales qualified lead, and that salesperson is now adding it to their pipeline. It's in their forecast. You've got some revenue uh, attached to that particular opportunity. And ultimately, you will either win or lose that opportunity. By the way, you can't win or lose a lead. You can wreck them, but you can't win or lose them. So don't try to close a lead. It's, it's not ready. That's why you have your MVPs in place. So once you close that particular opportunity, one of three things either happen. Even the salesperson can say, you know what, we thought they were ready for us, but they can't afford what we do. Or we thought they were ready for us, but they're not really big enough to, to, to use what we do. So we're going to pass that back to marketing. Let's nurture those a little bit differently. Uh, likewise, they go forward and they either win that opportunity and it becomes an account for them to then proliferate and uh, either upsell or cross-sell or sell a larger enterprise agreement to, or you lose them. For whatever reason, highly competitive opportunity, and you just, you just couldn't get it across the, the finish line. You just couldn't get it in the hoop. So in both cases, you want to analyze what went really, really well and what went really, really bad. The, the main point I want to talk about here is you've got three opportunities, not one. Not a lead, not a list, not a name. You threw over the fence to a salesperson and said, go score. But you've got three opportunities with which to nurture this particular opportunity. The first one may be automatic. It may be while they're on your website and your marketing automation technology is running in the background. Uh, and even if you don't, they're still, they're still doing something in the background, maybe talking to a third-party person or, or talking to one of your current clients on the phone. But that's happening without you knowing about it. Your second opportunity is this one-to-one this -one relationship. It's an email, a voicemail, a conversation on the phone. But it is your MVP, your demand gen person, engaging one-on-one, -on -one, not with that lead, not with that prospect, but with that human being who is either researching or investigating or, or getting ready to buy what you do. And then the final and third time, you have now an opportunity to nurture them once again. So they said they were ready. They want to buy your solution. Can they? Should they? Should you even include them in, in your client roster? So you've got three separate and very important opportunities to nurture that opportunity. The middle one is the most important one. That's where the rubber meets the road. By the way, I promise you that if you do some of these things, that here are some of the results that you might expect. And these are just a few, by the way. I, I, could, I could give you 10, 12, 15, but these are a few really important um, numbers that I want to focus on here. And by the way, when I, when I talk about these numbers, I'm talking about our clients, I'm talking about ourselves. At sales staff, we truly drink our own champagne. Everything that we do for our clients, we, we do for ourselves. And so we're very, very hard on what we do. We analyze and we overanalyze and we have a, a data type approach to everything that we do. Our lead conversion rates have improved as our clients have over 100% in the last several months. Our average deal size has improved by almost half. Many of our clients double theirs because they're talking to better prospects. And that pipeline velocity ratio number I talked about, a couple of very simple incremental pushes of a button or pulling of a, of a lever or turning of a dial, the simple things, if you just do it on the demand gen side, our, our pipeline velocity rate continues to improve, continues to improve month over month after month. So think about those numbers, and, and, and uh, I, I think it'll, it'll, it'll probably spur your, your, uh, your demand gen uh, thought process a little bit more. So I... I for the most part, don't read slides. I just, I just think that's a waste of all of our time, but I'm going to make an exception here. I think it's really that important. David Balzin, who, who founded this company, Sales Staff, over 20 years ago, uh, has become one of the, the, the preeminent speakers and thought leaders in our space, uh, a, a true trailblazer and an innovator in a lot of very uh, interesting things that have been proven highly successful in, in demand generation. In fact, just recently, we were, we were awarded the, the 2015 Demand Generation Program of the Year. So with David at the helm, we've accomplished quite a bit. Um, David said this and says this and says it often. And if you walk the halls, you hear this often. Telemarketing and cold calling are rapidly becoming extinct. Who has time, by the way? None of you people on the phone, I'll bet. If you look at your calendar right now, take a peek. I bet you don't have any time slotted today to be cold called. Nobody takes time on their calendar and sits there waiting to be cold called. However, he says, if you build an effective lead generation machine, it will drive results even if your salespeople and process aren't perfect, even if your salespeople and process are not 
perfect, it can be less than desirable if you have built an effective lead gen machine. At sales staff, we have a, a unique approach to demand generation, both for our clients and for ourselves, like I said. Uh, we call it Allbound 360. And now Allbound 360 combines the very best of digital inbound marketing techniques with the human element of outbound conversations to connect that last mile of sales opportunities to deliver the sales team that steady stream of qualified prospects uh, month after month, quarter after quarter. Larry Reeves, the Chief Operating Officer and EVP of Sales for the, the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals, I love what he wrote recently. He, he wrote that lead generation reps who can demonstrate knowledge about the prospect, their business, and the problems they can help solve will set themselves apart from the crowd and win the respect and business of many. So in closing, let me encourage you to put an all-star team of lead qualifiers in place. You can do it yourself, by the way. If you can, then do it yourself. If you can't, then I encourage you to partner with an experienced organization, one like sales staff, by the way. But I encourage you to include these most valuable players on your demand generation machine. Thanks, everyone, for spending part of your day with us today. Best of luck to each of you for a very strong quarter close. And Kelly, I'm going to turn it back to you to see if we have any questions, OK? Great. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> like Rick mentioned, we are now going to open it up for any questions you may have for him. Please continue to submit your comments and your questions via Twitter, or feel free to use the GoToWebinar user interface. Rick, the first question that we have um, is, is somebody's asking, can I just use a good lead scoring system to automate demand generation? So <clears throat> can I just use a good lead scoring system to automate demand generation? Well. These, these are very critical marketing functions, but they can never completely replace the human touch. Never. You, you want to make sure that every single lead that marketing passes to your sales team is as qualified as possible. And no automated system, no technology, no matter how well designed, will do this as well as a human. Plus, having a, um, having a human interact with, with a prospect gives you an opportunity to move the relationship forward. Not the lead, the relationship. And this means that your, your, your business development or your market response rep, they should take the time to, to help each prospect, offer them something at value. Even if they disengage, let them disengage and take away something from having known you. You want to make that positive impression upon them that automation can't do. Uh, you want to create future demand, even if they're not ready for you now. And you want to become that, that trusted resource that they, they come to. So what I'm saying is automation can, can, uh, can add a score and can, can do some things, but essentially, you don't want to treat your leads as, as just empty, blank faces to be um, questioned or harvested. You want it to be a relationship and a company that is a good match for your solution and even your culture, by the way. And, uh, and only a human being can help you do that. Thanks, Rick. Um, the next question is, which is better, outsourced lead qualification or in-house? Uh, trick question. Which is better, outsourcing or doing it yourself? Um, so I know what you're, you're thinking you're going to hear here. This is, a, this is a commercial for sales staff. Well, I'm, I'm, I may surprise some of you. If you can do it yourself and you can do it in-house, then do it in-house. You, you gain all the, uh, the, the, the wonderful uh, elements of, of, of uh, closed-loop feedback. Uh, if you have all your people living in the same office and you have uninterrupted access to, 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 to people and to feedback and quality, this, this is the way to optimize the machine. Uh, certainly from a price standpoint, uh, it, it generally is better to outsource because from an infrastructure standpoint, uh, when I think about just what we do, and, and I've, I've been a part of, of, you know, there's high tech, there's low tech, and po tech. You know, po tech was, was me, a list, you know, a list of people on, on some uh, recipe cards in a, in a plastic box and a couple people on the phone. Uh, but it worked when, when, when it was time to do that, but not anymore. But so from, from, a, from an investment standpoint, we, we invest a significant amount in, in, the, in the data and the technology-driven approach that we have. So, so in one element, if you can do it yourself, then do it yourself. If you can't, if you don't have the, the, the investment, if you don't have the resources, the inclination, maybe it's not motivated to manage that team because that's a team that has to be managed minute by minute every day. You've got to have somebody walk on the floor with a clipboard and a, and a whistle calling out cadence to them. And, and finally, if you like to have that team um, ultimately uh, become tomorrow's closers, then hire those people and train them to become tomorrow's closers. And by the way, having done both again, good luck with that. The DNA 
of a, of a, of a basketball scorer and the DNA of, of a basketball dribbler is, is slightly different. I want my prospectors and lead gen, lead gen team prospecting and generating demand. I want my closers closing. R very rarely have I been successful in taking a person with the DNA of, of a lead gen rep and uh, making them become closers. It, it doesn't work, and so uh, for, that, for that reason, uh, if I am going to do it myself, I make sure there's a hard separation. So if you can do it yourself, great. If not, I encourage you to, by the way, you don't have to choose sales staff, but choose someone somehow and, and, and mine the gap by, by putting that, that lead gen team in place. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Rick. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, how big should the lead qualification team be? <laughs> how, how big should the lead qualification? So since this is a basketball theme today, I'm, I'm guessing that you don't mean in height. So should they be uh, six foot five or can they be five foot six? So I'm, I'm thinking that you mean numbers. Um, the, the cost of, of calling a, an incremental lead that's not ready to become a sales lead today is very, very low versus the cost of not calling a qualified prospect and missing out on a really, really good deal. So however you set your lead score or however you set your, your qualification process, set the bar low enough so that your, your business development team can call a lot of people throughout the day. And so what that means is, you know, my bias is towards more lead gen reps than less. And depending on, on your solution, your average sales price, uh, an incremental lead generation person on your team can easily pay for herself by uncovering just a couple of incremental deals every month, I promise you. And, and lastly, I'll, I'll say you can also approach it by looking at the, the ratio of lead generation team members to your quota carrying sales reps. At sales staff, our, our BDR team or our business development lead generation team, we, we truly generate almost 90% of the sales pipeline. So we bias towards a, a relatively low ratio. And what I mean by that is one lead gen rep for every two or three salespeople. And if your marketing team, by the way, generates fewer leads per, sales per, per, per salesperson, or if you follow a less exhaustive follow-up sales process, or you just don't have the, the technology, the inclination, then your ratio can be much higher. You can have one to four, one to five, one to six. So that's how I would approach that. So uh, thank you very much for your questions, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for your time, and thank all of our attendees for, for your time as well today and, and for joining us. If we did not get to your questions um, during today's webinar, Look for a response from us shortly. Um, our winner today for the $50 Amazon gift card and for the awesome tweets is Ann Cole. And we will be reaching out to you shortly via Twitter. If you have any further questions, please visit salesstaff.com or feel free to reach out to Rick personally. You can also reach out through social media. As always, we look forward to hearing from you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone, um, for tweeting with us, and, and, and thanks again. Have a good afternoon.